Great. I think we should go for it. I'm still <laughs> going to stand up here in front, even though okay. <laughs> it feels a little bit goofy. Uh, also, I'm just going to put in a plug for anybody who's listening in online. We have way more staff here than attendees. So if it's feasible to come in person and doable for the coming seminars, then that would be awesome too. But also thanks to the many folks who are tuned in online as well. Uh, I'm Hannah Gavin. I'm the program manager for MSI. And today we're, we have a co-sponsored, co-coordinated event between two initiatives. So it's fun because initiatives themselves are by nature, we're trying to bring together researchers who are working across different departments and programs like we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. And so at least for MSI, we're trying to help make all the different microbial scientists at the various levels, students, trainees, postdocs, faculty, aware of all the awesome microbe related research that's happening at Harvard and across all the different Harvard affiliates. And then today we're expanding that even more by having a dual initiative collaborative event. So I'm super excited to hear about this because it's not an area I know much about. And I'm really, really interested in how we're going to hear about the intersections of, of bacteria and our perceptions of pain and itch. But before we get to yours, I'm going to turn it over to Parasite. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so uh, I'm the assistant director at the Harvard Brain Science Initiative, or HBI, and we're really delighted to um, be working with MSI. Um, so the Harvard Brain Science Initiative is an effort that brings together neuroscience researchers at the undergrad campus of Harvard, the medical school, and various different affiliated hospitals. Um, and you know, collaboration really excites us. Having two initiatives working together is an exciting program for us. Um, and today I'm really excited to get to introduce Dr. Isaac Tu, who is an associate professor um, of immunology at Harvard Medical School. Um, his work is really at the interface of neuroscience and immunology and microbiology. Um, his lab uh, focuses on neuroimmune interactions and host defense and inflammation. Um, he has found that nociceptor neurons and neurons that detect pain can directly detect bacterial pathogens in order to produce pain. These neurons also signal to innate immune and epithelial cells in the skin and the gut to mediate barrier immunity. Um, finding your immune signaling this way um, could lead to new treatments for pain and for inflammation. Uh, Dr. True did his PhD work in Mike Carroll's lab in the Immune Disease Institute at Boston Children's Hospital. He also did his postdoc in Boston Children's and Clifford Wolf's lab. Um, and just started his own laboratory about five years ago in 2014. And he's won a lot of exciting awards, including the Burroughs Welcome Fund, Investigators in the Pathogenesis of Infectious Disease Award, the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Ben Bears Award. And we're very excited to have him here today. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. And I'm so excited to bring these two initiatives together and the two worlds together, microbiology and neuroscience, which I think, um, you know, the crosstalk is actually where our lab is. And I think there's a lot of fruitful interactions between microbes and the host and the nervous system. So um, I'm gonna tell you today about hopefully topics that you haven't heard or thought too much about, but get you interested, um, specifically about bacteria and their interactions with neurons in pain and itch. So pain and itch are two uh, key sensory functions that I'll talk about. And um, some of my work I'll talk about is published and some will be unpublished. So it'll be awesome. uh, exciting to uh, present it to the communities. Um, so as uh, Parazad and Hannah gave a wonderful introduction for my lab, we are very much interested in the interface of three systems, micro, the microbial world, the nervous system and the immune system. And we're finding that neurons can directly sense microbes and also signal to the immune system. Uh, so this will regulate immune responses during host defense. And also neurons sense cytokines and factors from immune cells, which would prime uh, their function as well and also get regulated by microbes. So whenever you think about these complex interactions, you have to think about each context and how Maybe in some cases, the nervous system is uh, protecting the host from a microbe or, or inducing immune response. But while other cases, the microbe is actually hijacking these sort of interactions for its advantage. And I'll get into that uh, in my talk. 
but there, nonetheless, there's lots of really exciting, interesting unknowns in, in, in how these interactions occur. So for my talk today, I'll give you a brief introduction on pain, itch, and infection. And then I'll tell you two um, vignettes about these interactions. So the first one will be about bacteria and pain with a focus on uh, one bacterial pathogen, streptopyogenes, and its induction of pain, and also how um, we can actually target the neuronal signaling to treat infection. And then the, the second uh, kind of vignette will be on bacteria and itch, and specifically on Staph aureus, which is a major bacterial pathogen and how it could induce itch. Okay, so what, is, what are pain and itch? Well, pain and itch are actually um, two reflexes that are driven by nociceptors. And nociceptors are uh, a term that comes from Charles Sherrington, the great Charles Sherrington, who described the first neural reflex, which he used as pain as a prototypic example. He called, he said that there must be nociceptors that detect noxious stimuli that protect us, right? As, as um, hosts or as organisms, we have to be protected from these potential dangerous stimuli. Uh, so the, the pain reflex, as you can see here, is induced by a sensory motor reflex, so withdrawal from that noxious stimuli. And then itch is kind of analogous. So actually itch is, it's a, it's a scratch reflex. It induces a scratch reflex or this urge to scratch, which is there to remove potentially harmful things from the surface of the skin, right? So nociceptor these reflexes are driven by nociceptive neurons. And uh, now it's clear that these, where these neurons reside, they live within our peripheral sensory ganglia. Uh, for the body, these are in the dorsal root ganglia, which are all along the spinal cord. And they, are, they have two branches. So one that extends to the peripheral tissues, the barrier sites are places to detect the noxious stimuli. And then a central branch where they transduce their uh, action potentials to a spinal cord. And then here there's complex circuitry that relays the signal to the brain and we're perceived as pain or itch. What I'm trying to show you here is actually the DRG, uh, this is actually labeled with two different markers of neurons. It's a highly diverse set of neurons. So some will mediate um, thermal sensation, mechanosensation and pain, and others may mediate itch. So uh, I'm kind of oversimplifying this here, but there are definitely distinct types of neurons here that mediate pain and itch. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, the key role of these neurons are to protect us from danger. So we now know that uh, many types of molecular sensors are expressed by these nociceptors from and the peripheral terminals, some which detect noxious temperatures like heat or cold, others that detect electrophiles, so these uh, for example, trip A1 or trip B1, these are trip channels that detect noxious heat and no noxious chemicals. And then they also express ion channels like uh, P2X channels, they detect ATP that's released during injury, or they also have mechanosensing ion channels like piezos that sense uh, perturbations and force. Another major type of danger though to us is our pathogens. So, one of the questions we asked is whether these neurons have ways of detecting pathogens. Um, and, and, you know, the consequences of this uh, is that maybe this would protect us either in a behavioral response that protects us or maybe a cellular response where the neurons could regulate the immune system or the barrier response against these pathogens. And why did we start thinking about it? Well, actually, um, we know that many different types of infections are characterized by pain or itch. And so just to highlight some examples, you know, when we, and I will get into in more detail, like a strep pyogenes infection um, causes strep throat, which is very painful. And I'll get into strep infections. Strep mutans is the leading cause of dental caries, right? And that's a very pain inducing type of infection. We have gut infections like Salmonella or E. coli or Shigella can cause painful infections. And Staph aureus, um, when it, it's under the skin, it can cause these very painful boils. But when it's above the skin, I'll get into this, can cause itchy infections. 
Um, this is just a limited list. You can you can go beyond bacteria, right? If you think about parent worms are often inducing itch or fungi. So, you know, it's kind of been just thought about for a long time that these sensations are a consequence of inflammation or something related to the immune response or other responses that, and they're symptomatic. But what we're finding is that these neurons that I mentioned, the nociceptors are actually tuned to sensing these, these pathogens. And uh, this is a very exciting area where we find that nociceptors can directly sense pathogens. Uh, this is a, a summary of some mechanisms by which they can sense uh, pathogens. So, for example, gram positive bacteria, Streptiogenes and Staph aureus, can directly activate these neurons through their secreted toxins. Um, we found that these toxins, like alpha hemolysin or gamma hemolysin or streptolysin S, will form pores in the membranes of these nerves. And then you get ions coming in and you get action potential generation and, and, and um, pain. Uh, we also know that gram-negative bacteria can activate these neurons via different mechanisms, one being through M-formulated peptides, which are detected by uh, FPR1, which is a G-protein couple receptor on the neurons. And I, I worked on that when I was in Clifford Wolf's lab as a postdoc. Um, other labs have found that LPS and flagellin, which are characteristic of gram-negative bugs, can activate neurons through toll-like receptors like TLR4 and TLR5, which is the cognitive receptors for these ligands on immune cells, but they're actually expressed by subsets of these pain fibers. And also TRIP channels, TRIP A1 and TRIP B1, can be gated by LPS. And then kind of another example, which is interesting, is the idea of maybe bacterial factors that can block pain or itch. And there's one example, this mycolactone from this mycobacterium ulcerans that could that's thought to actually hyperpolarize a neuron uh, via the AT2 receptor. So this is again a growing area of interest, and um, you know I think raises a lot of questions, like why would a microbe want to silence or activate pain? Is it advantageous for the host or not? Right. Sure. Yeah. How about a human's abdominal pain? Is is it necessarily associated with a microbe or not necessarily? Oh yeah, so I mean, I think that there are many types of pain that are associated with microbes and others that are not. So if you just have a, a injury, right? Like if you have a sterile injury, that will cause pain because of the release of damage associated molecules, damps or ATP, like I mentioned. So there are some situations, of course, abdominal pain that could be caused that are not related to microbes, but we think microbes could be a major trigger of pain actually. And in fact, it kind of segues into this next slide, which is one of the interesting areas, which is whether the microbiome of the gut can also be sensed by these neurons. And this was actually work that we collaborated with um, Nissan Yisikar, who was a postdoc fellow in Christoph Benoit and Diane Mathis' lab. And this is actually calcium imaging of dorsal ganglion neurons, which include nociceptors, where we float on different gut bacterial preps and found that subsets of neurons were responding directly to certain bacteria, such as this bacteria, B. ovatis, C. ramosum, from in the gut. And this has implications. Maybe these then would drive pain responses, right? Um, actually, Nissan found a very interesting thing where these where the same bacteria also cause a neural immune interaction where the neurons regulate the T cells via this crosstalk of these microbes with neurons and, and immune cells. And, and, and actually to that point, um, how do these neurons signal to immune cells? Well, there's this phenomenon called neurogenic inflammation where um, at the peripheral nerve terminals of these neurons, you have axon reflexes where um, there is one axon, uh, one action potential that's going up to the brain that signals pain, but also there's back propagation along the neighboring axon terminals that leads to release of neuropeptides such as CGRP, substance P, and these will act, these neuropeptides will act on immune cells and on the vasculature. So you get a pain-driven immune response. So, so that kind of brings me back to this concept that, you know, we can have a microbe being sensed by these neurons 
And then these neurons release these factors that then talk to the immune system. So I'll illustrate that in, our, in the first story um, in terms of how this is affecting infection with strep pyogenes infection. So, so I'm switching back to the skin, but you know, if you have any more questions about the gut, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so this was really nice work conducted by uh, Felipe uh, Pena Rivero, who is a postdoc in my lab, and he's going to start his own job soon at WashU. Um, but he did really elegant work showing how bacteria and pain are connected in the context of strep pyogenes infection. So strep pyogenes is uh, also known as group A strep. It's a beta hemolytic gram positive cocci. And it is found in um, the upper respiratory tract and on the skin of, of many children, especially. Um, now, when it becomes pathogenic, it can cause a whole spectrum of infections. So one most common one is pharyngitis or strep throat, about 600 million cases a year. And, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, this can be very painful if you've ever experienced that. Um, in the skin, it can cause cellulitis. And then if it spreads out, it can cause rheumatic fever, uh, which is a, a big problem. Uh, we were actually particularly interested in one of the rarer um, forms of infection, but of which uh, strep pyogenes is the leading cause, which is necrotizing fasciitis or fleshing disease. It's a terribly invasive form of infection where the bacteria is really out of control and starts damaging you know, the deep tissues and the fascia. And the reason we were interested in it because our collaborator, Mike Vessels, who's an expert on strep pyogenes, was telling me clinically um, that you know, this type of infection is characterized by really extreme pain especially early on, like if you have actually not much like visible signs, but there's a lot of pain that could be a, a you know, become a flesh eating infection. So why is there so much pain? And, you know, could we understand the mechanisms that, that that's, you know, that's carrying out that pain, right? Um, so in order to study that, what Felipe did was he, again, we collaborated with Mike, Mike Vessel's lab, and got um, clinical strains of strep pyogenes and infected them in, in the mouse uh, foot pad in a, in a way that models necrotizing infection. So this is a, uh, one of the um, kind of pervasive clinical strains of strep pyogenes. And you could see uh, in a very rapid way, the, 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 the skin starts getting damaged in a necrotic way. Actually by histology, you can see here, this is normal skin. And then most of the skin tissue is necrotic, and then you get a lot of um, basically thrombi forming down here deep where the fascia is. So it's in a way like necrotizing fasciitis, uh, and it happens within 72 hours, so very quick. So we wanted to study, why did we use the foot pad? Because the foot pad actually is a densely innervated area where we can study pain reflexes. So just to illustrate that, actually one of the first things we measured was the acute nose effects of pain. So when you infect the mice and then you can watch them, within the first hour of infection, the mice start immediately lift, lifting and licking their, their area of infection. And this is what you would might see with a noxious stimuli like capsaicin, which is you know in the chili peppers that causes a lot of pain. The other thing we noticed was this acute flinching behavior. So it's a pretty robust um, pain uh, phenotype. And this is dose dependent. So if we look at, this is now looking at different amounts of bacteria that we infected into the mice. So CFU is colony forming units. So if we gave um, more bacteria, this first hour um, acute pain behavior is more and more. So, um, so dose dependent pain. Uh, just another example of how we measure pain. Uh, this is now pain sensitivity is using mechanical, uh, using von Fry filaments, which are little filaments of different pressures that you can put onto the foot pad of the mouse and measure the withdrawal reflex. So what we're looking at is the number of times that you need to, uh, out of 10 that will induce a, uh, a pain reflex. So if it's above 50%, then we call that the von Fry threshold. So what you're seeing here is a PBS control injected mouse where one gram of pressure would cause a pain reflex, a threshold. 
But with increasing amounts of bacteria, what you see is that now it only takes 0 0.008 grams to induce a pain reflex. And this is within the course of early on during infection. So with the higher doses, again, you get this very robust uh, pain, uh, mechanical hyperalgesia, so increased sensitivity to pain. Okay, so, um, so this shows that the bacteria can induce a lot of pain. So how does it work? Uh, so actually it turns out the key mediator we found of pain caused by infection is this pore forming toxin called streptolysin S. So uh, streptiogeny is actually makes two different pore forming toxins. One called streptolysin O, which is uh, oxygen labile. So it's, it, it's actually a large, it's a very different type of toxin. It's a large pore forming toxin that forms oligomers in the membranes. And streptolysin S is stable in oxygen. And it is actually a small peptide toxin. And it is encoded by this, encoded by this SAG opera. The SAG A gene encodes streptolysin S and all of these other genes are involved in post-translational modification and secretion of the toxin. And SLS is, medi is what mediates hemolysis. So when you diagnose you know, strep infection, uh, you look for, for this. Now, we were thinking this could induce neuron activation because in a nerve terminal, as I mentioned, if you form holes in the nerve terminal, it's like an ion shell. You'll get influx of cations and maybe pain fibers will respond by inducing uh, action protective generation of pain. So, so we look in, in a dish uh, with supernatant from strep pyogenes and we applied it to neurons. So here we have these dorsal ganglion neurons that include the nociceptors. And what you can see here is wild type bacterial supernatant can induce calcium influx in neurons. Um, what I don't show you here is that many of these same neurons also respond to capsaicin, which are marking nociceptors. But then if we knock out SAG-A, which encodes the SLS gene, or SAG-A and SLO, this calcium influx goes away. Um, but then we can restore it by adding in a uh, plasmid complementation of the SAG-A gene in back. So what about in vivo? Well, what you can see here is that kind of acute pain behavior. And actually, these are two different strains of streptiogenes, where we use isogenic mutant uh, strains. And what you can see here is that vehicle doesn't cause much spontaneous pain, but wild type bacteria causes a lot. The SLO single mutant doesn't show any difference, but the SAG-A deficient bacteria had a lot less pain, as well as the double knockout. Um, and then we wanted to kind of prove that this was mediated by using a neutralizing antibody. So we obtained that from collaborators where we co-injected a neutralizing antibody against SLS with the bacteria, and this could significantly block that pain as well. And compared to like an IgG control, right? In sure. The previous slides, you mentioned streptolysin causing pore. Where exactly the pore is? Yeah, so we think it's on. It's in the nerve. Uh, so in vivo, it would be in the nerve terminals in the skin. That's what we think is happening. In the in the dish, it's you know it could be the whole cell. Oh, we, we have no way of preventing that. Okay. Although it might be interesting in the future to use a. Capino chamber where we can dissociate the two sides of the neuron. Um, yeah, so that's, so we think this is a key molecule involved in pain. So then the question is, what is the role of pain in the immune response, right? So how do we ask that question? So this was one strategy we used. We targeted the nociceptors using the ion channel TRIP-B1. So TRIP-B1 is a um, uh, large pore cation channel that senses capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in chili peppers that causes pain, as well as noxious heat and low pH. Um, so trib one as many of you know, this year actually won the Nobel Prize for its discovery by Dr. David Julius. Um, it does mark a large proportion of nociceptive neurons. Uh, there are many subsets of trib one neurons, but we thought it was a broad way of targeting nociceptors. So we took a trib one Cree mouse, crossed it with the theriotoxin expressing so this will kill off the trib one neurons during development. And then the Cree negative mice will have, you know, nociceptors. And so what we did here is we switched the model a little bit to 
be able to measure the outcome of infection. So we look at the flank. And here, when you inject the bacteria into the flank, what you'll see is this time course of infection where you get these large dermatocrotic lesions and also weight loss. And what you see here is the mice that lack the nociceptors, the Cree positive, DTA positive mice, actually did better. So they had faster resolution of the dermonecrosis and faster re recovery from infection. So this is somewhat unexpected. So meaning you remove the neurons, actually they do better. So what is actually going on? So when we looked inside the lesions uh, of these um, infection sites and we did flow cytometry of immune cells, turns out that there are more neutrophils. So neutrophils, sorry, this is a lot of complicated data, but basically there were no huge changes in other immune cells, but neutrophils were increased in number in the trivial one pre dta mice compared to controls. And also in a second way to target these neurons, I, I haven't shown you the, the lesion data, but RTX is a uh, high affinity ligand for trip one that actually chemically kills the neurons. So we can treat the mice with RTX, infect them with the uh, strep pyogenes. And similarly, what we see is more neutrophil recruitment. Um, so how do these neurons regulate neutrophils? So it turns out one of the ways they, they do that, we think, is through the release of this neuropeptide called CGRP. CGRP, I mentioned, is stored in the vesicles of the nerve terminals, and it comes out when the neurons are activated. What we found is that CGRP is bad in the context of infection. So CGRP, here what we did is we mixed CGRP with neutrophils and also bacteria, and we looked at the multiplication of the bacteria. So in the absence of neutrophils, the bacteria multiply. In the presence of neutrophils, they are inhibited from growing. This is the opsonoprecipic <coughs> killing assay. If we add CGRP, this, all, this is inhibited. Uh, this is true for mouse neutrophils. And also if we added CGRP together with whole human blood, together with the bacteria. So CGRP inhibits uh, killing of the bacteria. Um, and so uh, now kind of we, we're thinking, okay, if neurons suppress neutrophil function, could we find a way to treat infection by blocking that neural signal? So actually what we ended up thinking about was using Botox. So botulinotoxin, I thought it might be interesting for this crowd as well, because botulinotoxins come from a bacteria, right? So botulinum neurotoxins come from um, C. botulinum, which actually there's seven different serotypes. There's BONT A through, I believe, A through G. And their mechanism of action is they cleave snare proteins, uh, which are in the terminals of neurons. And this prevents vesicle exocytosis, right? And so bot A is the major serotype being used clinically because it's very specific to SNAP25, which is a major snare found in neurons, but not in other, not many other cell types. So, um, so we thought if we block vesicle release, we can block CGRP release, and maybe that could help with treatment. So just a very brief summary here. What we did here is we treated the mice with the Botox and also with a current antagonist for CGRP signaling called BIBN4096. And in both cases, what you see is a much faster resolution of smaller domonocrotic lesions. Um, and then also we found that if we look in the site of infection for neutrophils by flow cytometry, we saw an increased number of neutrophils. So, um, this is summarizing a lot of data. What I've shown you here is that this bacteria we think actually is hijacking pain in this case. So what's happening is the bacteria secretes this toxin. You get this massive amount of pain, which accompanies something like necrotizing infections. On the one hand, this causes pain, but on the other hand, it causes nerves to release CGRP, which inhibits neutrophil function. So we could potentially block this whole kind of axis here by using either Botox or a CGRP antagonist. So after this was published, we were wondering, okay, strep pyogenes is a major pathogen, but what about other ones? Like since neutrophils are so key for controlling infection, could we apply this idea to other pathogens? So, so we teamed up with Allergan Pharmaceuticals, which is the maker of Botox, and we wanted to try their actually clinical formulation. 
And we try, I won't show you the data for streptomyogenes, it's basically peanut copies what we published, but we also now looked at other bacteria. So in this case, Pseudomonas as a kind of model gram negative pathogen. And you can see again, if you treat the mice with Botox, and here we're injecting them at day two post-infection, you get an immediately smaller kind of progression of abscesses as well as lesions. Um, and, and similarly, uh, actually subcutaneous staph infections. So staph is a, a major gram-positive pathogen that causes abscesses. Um, you know, injecting Botox can accelerate uh, the resolution of the lesions. So we're very interested in this idea of applying these knowledge to treat infections. Um, so, okay, so with that, I'm gonna kind of move to the next part, which is about itch. So hopefully I have enough time to go through this. This is all unpublished data. Can I interrupt you with a sure. question from the online crowd? Yes, of course. Robert's asking whether there's any evidence that the pain arising from trp one nociceptors may be modulated by peripheral NMDA receptors or that the neuroimmune interactions such as neutrophil recruitment may be modulated by NMDA receptors. Wow. I haven't thought about that. So NMDA receptor signaling in the neurons. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there's a lot of questions about what could block that. Is that question like maybe NMDA blocking or targeting NMDA could block the pain perception. Um, so one thing I wanna clarify, which is quite interesting is that the neuroimmune signaling only requires calcium influx and neuropeptide release at the peripheral nerve terminal, but doesn't require pain perception. So we actually did an experiment where we injected Botox centrally into the spinal cord, and that completely blocked pain, but did not, the perception of pain, like the pain behavior assays we did, but had no effect on the peripheral um, immune response. Mm. So we think that these two processes, one is local and it's immediate, that's not related to pain perception, and then the you know, the brain and the CNS part is, is, is related to perception. And maybe NMDA sure. signaling would act on maybe the more central, uh, you know, pain perception side. Cool. Thank you. When you infect the minds, did all of them behave in the same way or was there any exception? Oh, that's a good question. So whether there's variability in the pain response. So I think the hyperalgesia that I mentioned, like the the von Frey filament's pretty uniform. The spontaneous pain, there's always variability and it could be depending on, you know, mouse to mouse. And, and I think that's especially the case actually when I talk about itch next. So, you know, some of these behaviors are voluntarily, it's what the mouse is feeling, right? And, and what, what leads to that reflex could be, you know, depending on their state. As I was comparing with the humans, we all right. You know, uh, respond differently when such a thing happens. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And there's lots of variables that can modulate pain, like you know, other things like anxiety and you know, uh, yes. stress, as well as um, maybe the time of day. You know, at least you know, sleeping. And so I think there's a lot of variables related to pain and itch. Okay, so um, this next part I'm going to talk to you about is really uh, really nice work that's been led by very talented uh, postdoc in the lab, Lee Wen, and was started by Kimbria Blake, who is a former graduate student who's now working um, at a um, GenoSkin, which is a skin uh, company studying skin and immune interactions, and also um, really uh, got a lot of help from Samantha, who's our lab manager, as well as the research assistant who helped with this project. So um, just to start off, you know, what is itch? So just to come back to this question of pain versus itch. So itch is, we all experience it. It's an uncomfortable sensation. And it's very specific, I think, to the skin. So you think about itch and skin, right? And it's a desire to scratch. Um, why do we itch? Uh, so I, I briefly mentioned it earlier, but it's thought, I mean, really, this is kind of a philosophical question because, <laughs> you know, but the idea is that we need to, like, be protected from ectoparasites. Maybe you're in the forest and you get surrounded by mosquitoes and this is a way to get rid of those um, things. And also potentially to remove 
noxious or harmful things that get on your skin before it gets deeper. Uh, but also it is associated with allergies and uh, pathological in that context in terms of uh, chronic itch is very difficult to treat. Um, actually, nobody has ever studied how microbes and itch are linked. So, so I think it's an interesting area. Now, why, why are we interested in staph aureus? Well, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get into that. Um, so staph, uh, just but br briefly to, to introduce staph aureus, it's a major, probably the leading cause of human bacterial infections. And, you know, it does commonly colonize the skin as well and the nares of people. Uh, methicillin resistant strains are on the rise. And I think, um, you know, this is a big problem of, you know, treating, treating bacterial infections generally. In our study, we mainly use MRSA, uh, the USA 300 strain for those of you who study staph. Uh, so this strain produces many different virulence factors, including toxins that we actually previously found in a subcutaneous infection context cause pain. So staph can activate neurons to cause pain, but can it cause itch? And why do we ask that? Because of the disease is called atopic dermatitis or eczema. So eczema is a very common uh, skin condition that's characterized by itch. In fact, it's sometimes called the itch that rashes. So you scratch, it's like the itch scratch cycle and it, it's in 20% uh, of children, 10% of adults. And it's thought that microbial dysbiosis and variant dysfunction is a key part of AD of which staph aureus is one of the main components of that dysbiosis. So staph is detected in about 70 to 90 percent of AD patients, and it's um, enriched in the lesions where there's there's uh, eczema. Also, another interesting um, thing is if you look at the lesions, the density of nerve fibers actually are higher in the staph and the eczema lesions. So that could potentiate more scratching, right? So the question we wanted to ask is, can staph be associated with itch. So how do we study that? Well, in mice, um, people have developed models where you can induce staph epicutaneous infections. So here um, we've adapted them to study itch. So what we do is we take a gauze with staph aureus and we apply it on the surface of the skin of mice with tegaderm tape. And then we look over the course of several days and you get actually significant inflammation and also we think itch. So I'll show you that data. Um, we, we did a whole time course. Day five is the one where we saw the most significant itch induction. So the data I'll show you there is from day five. So first, uh, this is just to show you how the skin looks after five days of this epicutaneous model. You see this kind of wet looking inflamed skin compared to the control. Uh, and if you look at histology, you get this really uh, thickening of the skin with huge amounts of immune influx. Um, and we can measure this and quantify this using a skin score system, which consists of um, four different parameters of which, you know, the highest score is three, so, four, so 12 is the highest score. And we call it uh, kind of in, in infection-induced dermatitis here. You can see very robust induction of this inflammation in this model on um, both males and females. Um, the other thing we can measure is called transepidermal water loss. So one of the things that happens is the barrier, epithelial barrier is damaged and you get, um, it becomes wet, you can see here. And we can actually measure that using a tool meter. And this is very robustly induced in this model in both males and females in terms of that. So how about itch? So how do we study itch? So what we've been using is we've been using uh, infrared behavioral observation box, which actually we um, adapted from Clifford Wolf's lab. Uh, they've been using this. Now mice are more comfortable in the, in the dark, so we can watch them. And here are four animals. And we're, what we're basically doing is recording them and they're scratching behaviors. And so uh, you can see some of these mice, like this one here is lifting its paw and scratching the area that's been infected. And then we count the numbers of bouts of scratching over the course of 90 minutes. 
And that you can see here, there's a very robust induction of scratching over the controls in this model. Okay, so this is kind of spontaneous itch behaviors that we can measure. And then another way we can measure itch is called allokinesis, which is touch induced itch. So, you know, when you rub against, when you're itchy or inflamed and you rub against something that's like touch, it can cause an itch behavior. So this is what, what we do is we, we poke the mouse with a von Prey filament that's very, very small. And then if you can see that like a response where it got poked and it starts to scratch. So what we do is we poke it um, uh, basically, I believe nine times, and then you measure the, the numbers of responses and induce a scratch in those nine times. And so this is what you see here is with the staph infection, you get this very robust induction of allokinesis. Okay. So you guys might want to think like, what is the consequence of too much scratching? Um, so actually Lee Wan was very clever and she looked at, so if you remember the, the mice are under this tape. So in the first five days, they actually can't scratch. So it's only after removing the tape that they can start scratching. And what she did was she looked at the skin after allowing them to scratch for six hours during that final day. And you can see before scratching and after scratching, there's a huge difference. Like there's actually a lot more skin damage <laughs> by the scratching itself. So we've also quantified this sort of total skin damage, which we think a large part of it is induced by the itch behavior itself, right? So this is pathological. This could facilitate the bacteria getting into your skin more or maybe the spread of the bacteria because of, of that. Okay, so then one of the things that Lee Wan also wanted to see is potentially there could be interactions of these bacteria with nerves. So she's staying here. What she's doing is taking the skin samples from these um, infection sites and in three different areas uh, and label the bacteria in green. Here's a GFP staph aureus and then label nerve fibers in red. And what you could see is um, both, you know, kind of at the site with there's tons of bacteria as well as at neighboring sites, you can see bacteria that are juxtaposed to nerves. And so these guys could be interacting and the itch fibers are right there at the surface of the skin. Uh, another thing you guys might want to ask is like I mentioned that subcutaneous infection causes pain. So we wanted to prove whether there was actually a difference between above, above the skin versus below the skin in terms of behavior. So what Lee did was actually compared epicutaneous versus subcutaneous infection. So you can see, first of all, the pathology is quite different. With epicutaneous, you get this inflamed skin on the top, whereas subcutaneous, you get this giant dermonecrotic lesion. And then if you quantify the itch, you can see that epicutaneous infection causes the itch, but subcutaneous, very little, right? So something about the surface of the skin causes the itch. So um, we actually then, the next question is what, products from the bacteria and what factors causes this itch. So actually, I'm, I, I won't go through a lot of negative data. So we ruled out a lot of things that we suspected, including some of the pore foaming toxins that we had talked about causing pain. Uh, but it turns out the key is actually proteases. So proteases are very interesting. So Staph aureus actually secretes 10 different types of proteases. Um, and uh, this is, actually relate, we thought it was very interesting because proteases have been linked to itch from other sources. So for example, house dust mite, um, and also this really itchy plant called a cow hedge, and also papaya papain has been caught, has been shown to cause itch by acting on different receptors on the surface of the nerve fibers, including these MRG receptors and PARs, and I'll get into that. Um, but staph secretes 10 different proteases uh, and they are kind of listed, the gene names here. So what we did is we collaborated with Alex Horsewill's lab, who was an expert on, on these proteases from the University of Colorado. And he sent us mutant strains that lacked different sets of these proteases. <coughs> and we wanted to see which ones contribute to itch. So first of all, um, we took the one that lacked all the proteases. Um, Sorry, I think something is wrong with this slide here, but basically this is the skin score. And what you could see is that number one, lacking the proteases makes a big impact on inflammation. 
So, you know, there's much less inflammation caused by uh, the infection with this mutant strain. Now, allokinesis is partially dependent, as you can see, compared to the wild type, there's significantly less allokinesis. But the spontaneous itch, which is something that a lot of people use as a key measure of itch, is very much back to baseline when you have total block lacking of these proteases. So um, as I said, there's 10 of them. So we had to start kind of ruling in or ruling out different ones. And this is just to show you, you know, some of the data where we then went after some subsets. So this is to show you actually negative data that the RO lysin, which is one of them, and also these other two, SSPB and SCPA, you knock those out and there's still similar amounts of both spontaneous itch and allokinesis. Um, but what turns out, actually after, I didn't show you all the data, but it turns out it's one single one that's key called V8, V8 protease. It's encoded by this SSPA uh, gene. And what I'm showing you here is the data for that. So this delta SSPA lacks V8, and then SS plus SSPA is the one where it's been complemented back into the bacteria. So what you can see here is that the wild type bacteria cause a lot of inflammation, and the knockout of SSPA has much significantly less inflammation, and that goes gets complemented partially back with the SSPA complementation. But then and if you look at allokinesis and spontaneous itch, you can see the huge difference here. So wild type causes a lot of allokinesis, is significantly less than the SSPA uh, mutant, and it's complemented back. And same thing with spontaneous itch. So this is a bacterial protease. Um, it's actually quite interesting. So this protease is, it's a very specific for cleaving after glutamate residues. Um, it's a serine protease, but it's, actually very useful biochemis biochemically. So it's been used by biochemistry labs as ways of cleaving you know, glut after glutamates. So um, for staph, in terms of what its role, it's thought to play a role in biofilm dispersion as well as nutrient acquisition. And there has been some evidence that it plays a role in skin inflammation as well. So um, it's quite interesting. So we wanted to ask, can V8 protease on its own induce itch. So how do we test that? So um, one of the ways to distinguish itch from pain is actually something that was figured out by Bob Lamott at uh, Yale, that if you inject something into the cheek of the mouse, they would behave differently if it's a pain stimuli versus an itch stimuli. So if it's an itch stimuli, it causes the mouse to scratch with its hind paw, but if it's a pain stimuli, it will cause the mouse to start wiping with its forepaw. So we, again, use the IBOP, and here, instead of injecting into the back, we inject into the cheek. And um, what I'll show you here is the data. So what you could see here is that V8, this is now looking at hind paw scratching, can induce very robust itch behaviors. And this is actually even stronger than histamine, which is a prototypic itch ligand. Capsaicin is a control because capsaicin is a pain ligand. You can see it doesn't do much, doesn't induce much itch behaviors, but it induces significant pain behaviors. And V8, as you can see here, doesn't induce pain. So it's a very, we think, specifically inducing itch. Uh, what about the other modality that I mentioned, allokinesis? So what Li Wen did here is she here she did inject V8 into the back because then you can poke it with the, the von Fry filament. And you can see in the first 60 minutes the V8 injected um, mouse actually has significant induction of this allokinesis. And this is kind of quantified uh, over those 60 minutes. Again, it's stronger than histamine, which is a very prototypic itch ligand. So it's very itch inducing, we think this protease. Okay, so we think V8 is a key factor to induce itch during infection. So what are the mechanisms on the host side? That induce this itch? Are there mechanisms, right? Are there receptors? So, um, so to study this, we, we, we can, like I mentioned earlier, take dorsal ganglia neurons, put them in a dish, and then study whether they respond to different ligands. So we can add, for example, V8 or capsaicin or KCL, which will activate all the neurons in the dish. And so some of this is still preliminary, but we could see very clearly 
um, subsets of neurons here in calcium traces and also calcium energy fields responding to V8 that don't respond to the buffer or actually heat inactivated V8. So that's kind of a control. And many of these also respond to capsaicin, uh, which is the trippy one like yet. Um, we also, in collaboration with Brian Wanger's lab, started flowing on different itch ligands, including histamine, but also chloroquine, which is um, an itch ligand for one of these receptors on MRGA3. And it seems like a lot of these V8 neurons also respond to chloroquine. So we're still trying to figure out which exact subsets of neurons are responding. But we really want to know the receptor side, you know, what could be involved. So turns out the receptor that we think is mediating this is a protease, proteinase activated receptor, PAR. So these are um, host receptors for proteases. And there are actually several PARs that, you know, cells can express. Uh, so there's PAR1, PAR2, PAR3, and PAR4. PAR1, 2, and 4 are the functional ones. PAR3 actually doesn't have a signaling. <laughs> And the way these work is actually quite interesting. So the protease comes and cleaves a tethered ligand, which is at the uh, terminus of the receptor. And then this ligand then binds to itself to, and then it activates a GPCR signal. So why do we think PARs are involved? Because actually PARs have been linked to itch in multiple contexts, uh, not bacterial infections, but looking at, as I mentioned, some of these plant-derived proteases as well as immune derived proteases, they act, they've been thought to activate PARs. And also, as I mentioned, PARs are expressed in the itch fibers. So this is just a heat map showing expression of these PARs, these first three in substance of the itch fibers. So we want to ask, can V8 activate PARs? So we collaborated with um, Ritswick Ramachandran, who's in Canada, and he's one of the leaders in looking at PAR activity. And he has developed this luminescence-based assay where um, basically the, um, you can add a protease to these uh, different, he transfects cell lines with PARs, and then you could watch the activity by looking at luciferase uh, in a, in a uh, luminescence assay. So here is the data. So using what he has here is Cho cells transfected with PAR1, PAR2, or PAR4. And then looking at the um, concentrations at which we see luminescence. And what you can see here is that V8 can pretty potently cleave PAR1, doesn't really do much at PAR2, and can at kind of higher concentrations cleave PAR4. Okay, so PAR2 is the one that's been published in multiple papers on itch. So I won't show you the data, but PAR2 knockout mice have no phenotype in our set, in our thing. So we zeroed in on PAR1 because it has, a, and actually the, I, I'm not showing you the data, but thrombin is the main, like protease that's been, you know, linked to PAR1 activation and V8 cleaves it to the same extent as thrombin. So it's pretty strong, the active. So what Li Wan did was sit, then next tested whether blocking PAR1 may have an effect on the itch. So here, what she's doing, she took two different pharmacological antagonists against PAR1. Um, actually, this one's an FDA-approved drug right now for thrombosis. And what you could see is a dose-dependent blockade of itch induced by the V8 by treating with the PAR1 antagonists. And very similarly, we can also block the allokinesis very robustly using this voropaxar, which is a nice... Um, you know, oral drug that we can give. Uh, so this is actually after 90 minutes. And also she measured the tool, which is kind of a measure of damage that's induced by the V8, and that could also partially block that. So then we want to test it with staph infection, right? So does it let, do anything there? So what they went did, infected the staph and treated them daily with V8. And what you can see right away is that actually the inflammation part of things that's caused by the bacteria is not affected directly by the Vorpaxar treatment, like including the bacterial load. And, and this is before we let them scratch. So the first, you know, but what she did, did see was that after you remove the tape, there was a pretty significant decrease in spontaneous itch and allokinesis caused by staph infection with the Vorpaxar treatment. Um, 
So then, then the parameter that I mentioned, the scratch induced damage, is also highly significantly decreased by the more pack star. So we're quite excited about this. So um, what I've shown you here is what we think as a summary of this last part is that epicutaneous staph infection causes itch. And this is through secretion of this V8 protease. It acts on PAR1, which is on neurons. <coughs> and then on the one hand, this contributes, uh, the V8 probably also acts on the skin to contribute to skin inflammation but it further exacerbates things by inducing scratching, which then damages the skin further. So, um, so basically what I've shown you is that neurons can directly sense this protease. And then also that we think this is through part one and we're excited to see if uh, you know, this can be applied, you know, blocking itch. Okay, so just as an overall summary, I, what I've shown you is that microbes and Neurons and immune cells can interact with each other. Uh, and in some cases, like strep pyogenes infection, this causes extreme pain. And this could be you know, inducing a neural immune suppression. And then in other cases, the bacteria can cause itch, which again, the nervous system then leads to the scratch-induced damage that could be something for us to consider in terms of treating things like atopic dermatitis. So um, again, uh, I've acknowledged like Felipe, Li Wen, Kimbri, and Samantha were the key leaders of all parts of these studies. And then they got help from members of my lab who are all fantastic. Um, and then we also got really great help from collaborators, including Mike Vessels on the strep pyogenes work, Alex Forswill, Rithwick, uh, Ramachandra, Narendasa, and Brian Wanger on the uh, staff uh, itch story. So happy to take more questions. Ooh, <laughs> oh, wow. This was awesome. This is one of the best, most interesting talks I've, <laughs> I've heard in a while. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I do have some questions, but sure. there are also, you know, more than 50 folks online. So I'll try to relay a few of their questions first. Starting off with Hiroki's asking about the molecular determinants that distinguish between pain and itch, both of which are caused by the same pathogen, Staph aureus. Mm -hmm. um, Pain induced Staph aureus reported by Dr. Chu, and today itch also introduced by Staph aureus. So that's a great question. So I think it's probably on the host side. So, as I mentioned, there are distinct neurons that mediate pain and itch. Um, so, the PARs, for example, could be expressed mainly on the itch fibers, whereas uh, maybe the pain response, where these toxins induce, you know, pretty general activation of neurons activate all the pain fibers. And also the other thing that I think those who study pain and itch know is that pain inhibits itch. So if you activate pain fibers, you know, mm. it will actually block the itch signal at, at the spinal cord level. Okay. So we think the, the second part with the V8 is probably because of the PAR expression, the PAR1 expression. And we're trying to nail that down right now. Actually, we have collaborators. I didn't mention uh, Ted Price here was looking um, also at where it's expressed in human you know, neurons that, and we see it pretty highly enriched in just itch fibers, which is interesting. Okay. Yeah. I have a question sure. about the model with Staph aureus and the gauze and, and on top of the skin. And I'm curious about whether it on its own is able to breach the skin barrier when it's placed uh, uh, not subcutaneously on, on top of the yeah. skin and then yeah and or whether then that is facilitated by the scratching behavior? That's a great question. So both good questions. So um, it's thought that the, actually the gauze by having the tape wrapped there, it actually causes the bacteria to turn on the quorum sensing mm. machinery. So I didn't show you actually, the itch is also dependent on the AGR, which is the quorum sensing, key okay. quorum sensing machinery. So because I think it's, they're kind of squeezed into that area. So then they start invading. They start turning on their virulence yeah. factors, including the proteases that will allow them to start invading from the above. So yes, they start breaching that barrier. Okay. Um, the second question I think would be really important to know, does the scratching further accelerate that breach? Mm -hmm. um, we think it would be very interesting to know the consequences downstream, not just of infection, but also of the immune response, because scratching could cause inflammation that drives, you know, 
worsening immune responses that then feeds back as well in terms of itch as well, you know, damage. During winter time, many of us get itching. Yeah. Uh, is it caused by the micro in any way involved? And do you find such <coughs> itching in mice, the weather induced pattern? Yeah, yeah. So there's um, dry skin is actually a major cause of itch. So there are ways of modeling that in mice. So you could use an acetone ether water mix, and this will cause a pretty robust itch phenotype. It's not thought to be microbe driven, but nobody's ever tested that. You know, nobody's ever seen if you eliminate microbes from the skin, whether <laughs> that goes because, away or not. Or if in there's a change, I'd be curious too if there's a change yeah. in the microbial community yes. in dry skin versus non dry. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Skin. I yeah, that'd be I think, interesting. I think it'd be very interesting to know. Um, you know, the other that also raises the question whether the microbiome beyond Staph aureus are other skin microbes like Staphylococcus or other ones that colonize our skin, can they drive this process in some way? So I'm really interested in uh, variations across different people and the you know perception of uh, pain and itch. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering about development and um, like early on when the nociceptors or itch sensing neurons are developing, um, like human genetic variations, I'm curious about, and also I'm curious whether experience, like if there's some kind of critical period where you're exposed to certain microbes or not exposed, if that makes any change? Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. So nobody's really looked carefully at the role of the microbiome, skin or gut, in terms of development of the nervous system, in terms of pain or itch. I think that that would be very important because, like you said, there could be a critical period. Uh, we know in the I, I, there has been papers showing that inflammation early in life, inflammation can induce nerve sprouting in, 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 the, in the lungs, actually, in the context of asthma. Wow. So I haven't seen anything where similarly was done in the skin, you know, to look at whether either microbes or immune cells could prime, you know, early life sprouting of H fibers. Um, we know that eczema is very prevalent in kids. So, yeah. um, the consequences of that early, you know, eczema that kids have on the nervous system is also not studied. And I think that would be interesting to know. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. In terms of genetic variations, I'm thinking about autism. You know, our center mm -hmm. recently had a talk on that brain yes. signaling and such. Um, and I was thinking about the experience of you know people who are have itch very easily with like tags. You know, you hear about kids um, buying clothes where they don't the tags are cut off or things like that. It just made me wonder if we, if you think about that ever. If, if yeah, yeah, I think that, um, you know, Dr. Lauren Orofice, who's in, at MGH, is really interested in this idea that maybe autism remodels, um, you know, the peripheral nervous system, which she's already found in, in, you know, in the skin, but how that then interacts maybe with microbiomes. So that, that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, I think autism, you know, ASD, there's a lot of interest in the gut microbiome being dysregulated in autism uh, yeah. patients. So there could be kind of a positive feedback too. We found, for example, that nociceptors in the gut regulate the composition of the microbiome. So it could be, you know, if there's dysregulated neurons and then you get a feedback into the gut uh, microbiome and vice versa as well. So very interesting. Yeah. The skin microbiome is, has been less studied in this context. So. I'm curious if you have oh please. No, 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 no. oh I was just gonna say I'm curious if you have a feeling at this stage in the research I'm I'm trying to form a model in my mind of where things are at in terms of is it is this signaling and and talk beneficial to the infected Post? Is it beneficial to the microbe? And I'm imagining that maybe what you would find is that it's going to depend on the host microbe interaction. Right, right. What's your take on that at this point? <laughs> I, I, I keep an open mind. So, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't coming into that first story. We were not thinking that this would be beneficial for the microbe, but it ended up being that way. <laughs> so, so I think it really depends on each situation. Um, you know, I think we found, like, for example, I didn't talk about a story where in the gut we found nociceptors are important in keeping salmonella at bay. Okay. So 
you know, in that case, they're benefiting the host to have detection of the salmonella. Mm -hmm. But in the skin I just showed you with, with strep pyogenes, it's actually being hijacked by yeah. the bacteria. For the itching, the scratching, I don't think that's beneficial for the host, but you know, we don't know until we do a little more you know, downstream studies. That looks not beneficial for right, the host. Right. <laughs> because you get more damage. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing that would, is interesting to think about is transmission. So there was a very interesting study. Um, this is an analogous reflex I didn't talk about, which is cough, where you, in the lungs you have nociceptogen that oh, okay. cough. And there was a really interesting paper from Michael Shiloh's lab showing that tuberculosis secretes a factor that acts on nociceptors to facilitate mm. coughing, right? So can, an itch may be similar, like if you get staph on your skin uh, and then you scratch it and then you can contact somebody else. Sure. Does it facilitate, is this, is this helping the bugs get from person to person? Mm. Um, that's. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting to investigate. Yeah. Do you have any questions or? Ah, so sure. how, how do you, how do you know the two candidates? Because because I think uh, a key thing here is to find the uh, candidate list mm -hmm, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, try the uh, proteins to see which really works. Yeah, I think that a lot of it is just you know guessing. To be honest, <laughs> educated guessing. I mean, we were thinking about potential virulence factors that could interact with neurons in some way. Um, so with strep, the cock is, actually staph is a lot more complicated. Staph has so many different toxins and proteases. The strep, uh, our collaborator, Mike Vessels was saying, there's these two toxins. There's these streptolysin O and S that were the two key pore forming toxins. So staph has probably eight or nine of them. You know, it's, it's a lot more complicated. So at least we could think about that as mechanism. But you're right, I think in the future, if we had a way of, and this would be if I had better tools, but if we had a way of screening, you know, let's say neurons, it's just hard to do screens because there's so few of them. But if, if, if we could say, take microbial products and just see what microbial products will activate neurons and have a library of them, that would be more elegant than going after like one at a time and just guessing. But, um, yeah. Okay, so you mean this is based on uh, education guess? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and maybe I didn't clarify. So my previous work when I was at Clifford Wolf's lab, I found that alpha hemolysin, a pore forming toxin, is very important in causing pain. Uh, so when we came to the strep pyogeny side, that's why we thought about pore forming toxins uh, right away. It wasn't like, you know, we so you can have a similar structure or? Um, yeah, so the streptolysin O actually, we initially thought maybe like, because it's more similar to alpha hemolysin, it's a large, it's a, it forms large oligomers and really large pores. Whereas this peptide toxin doesn't, I mean, it's kind of an amphipathic, it probably causes little holes in the membrane, but it, it's not structured as the streptolysin O. So, but then when we did the knockouts experiments, it ended up being streptolysin S, not O. That was key. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know if I, maybe I didn't tell the background as much, but I think there are many different bacterial pore forming toxins from different bugs, and they're very important for their spread and nutrient acquisition. So there's a whole families of them from different, you know, pathogens. And so, this could just be, you know, one subset that, that is inducing this pain response. Well, I know you've given us a few extra minutes of your time, sure. so I'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. Thanks so much to everyone who's attended here and online. This is really fabulous. Okay, Thank you. great. Thank you.